This audio presentation of The Answer Will Come by Robert A. Russell, Chapter 1, Call Upon Me. Today, bewildered people in a changing world are seeking spiritual comfort and searching for answers to their many problems. With material standards changing and earthly ties breaking, they are clinging with renewed hope to the faith that came mystically to the world the first Christmas long ago in Judea. All men are puzzled and fascinated by the unknown. What is the truth? Where is it to be found? What is the perfect solution to the unsolved problem? What is the unknown quantity represented by poverty, limitation, and sickness? These questions asked by man throughout the ages continue to be asked today, and yet the answer was stated simply by the Master. I am the truth. A man who has the consciousness of God's presence finds that the so-called problems in his life are solved automatically. Consciousness, you know, is not wholly a mental thing. It was whatever you are mentally, emotionally, spiritually. So merely talking about Christ in principle will never solve a problem any more than talking about music will make one a musician. Understanding must have roots in feeling as well as in thought. Metaphysically speaking, since there is no such thing as an unanswered problem, it is not necessary to struggle to obtain an answer. You have only to recognize that there is an answer and then to fulfill the conditions of mind, unity with God, abstraction, stillness, silence, through which the answer can make itself known. The problem and the answer are so indissolubly joined together that if one of them is apparent, the existence of the other is certain. While there can be no problem without an answer, the answer will come to you only when you accept it, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. What is the unknown quantity represented by a problem? It is unity with God. The way to get quick solutions to problems and instant results from prayer is stated in the scripture. He maketh my feet like hinds feet, and setteth me upon my high places. A problem exists only in the human mind. The answer exists eternally in the mind of Christ. To get the human mind and the Christ mind together in perfect harmony and unity is to have the answer. Does that sound too metaphysical to you? Then let us state it this way. The person who has the most perfect correlation between his conscious and subconscious mind is the one to whom the answer will come most quickly. Out of the heart are the issues of life. Since the subconscious mind is the principal field in which the Holy Spirit does his work, we must make it possible for the answer to get through by keeping an open channel between the conscious and the subconscious mind. What did Jesus mean when he told us to take no thought? He meant for us to stop our own thinking, to still the human mind, the bodies of our thoughts, the bodies of our feelings and emotions, and the physical body. To the degree that we succeed in doing this, does the Christ arise in us and become our Savior. It is not by any system of thinking, affirming, or praying that the answer come and our needs are supplied, but by the advent of the Christ in our consciousness. The Son of Man, or the answer, cometh at an hour when ye think not, not during the periods of reasoning, thinking, planning, or deducting. All God wants is an opportunity to supply these things which seem to be lacking in our lives, we give him that opportunity when our material senses are silent and the conscious and subconscious minds are perfectly integrated or moving as one. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray. Pray when the door of the conscious mind is closed, not while it is open. Closed to the human mind, it is open to Christ. Closed to evil, it is open to good. Closed to sickness, it is open to health. Close to error, it is open to truth. Close to personality, it is open to God. Jesus said, Shut thy door. We add, Keep it shut. Stand guard at the door of the conscious mind, the intake to consciousness, and refuse to let it entertain any evil or negative suggestions. This is the only work anyone has to do. It is a law of mind that if we stop accepting the suggestions that come to us through the human mind, Suggestions of evil, trouble, sickness, poverty, and the like, these things will die to us. When the door of the conscious mind is closed, Christ takes command. When we have this mind in us, which was also in Christ Jesus, we shall know the truth automatically and shall be freed from all shackles. It will no longer be necessary for us to try to know the thing or to direct our thinking. We shall have no responsibility resting upon our shoulders, for all responsibility will be given over to Christ to whom it belongs. When we have shifted the responsibility for our living to Him, the truth will make us free. The answer will come. Now that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, 
but our sufficiency is of God. The thing that most truth students do not realize is the tendency of every thought and feeling to create. Jesus said, A good man, out of the good he has accumulated in his heart, produces good. And a bad man, out of what he has accumulated that is bad, produces what is bad. For his mouth says only what his heart is full of. He maketh my feet like hinds' feet, and setteth me upon my high places. Our words tend to be the product of our conscious mind, but out of the heart or subconscious mind are the issues of life. Someone has beautifully said, When the lips and the heart are in alignment, when they track together with the absolute certainty that the rear feet of the deer track with the right feet, then nothing is impossible, whether it be climbing the mountains or casting the mountains into the sea. The answer will come when the conscious and subconscious minds are perfectly synchronized or moving in perfect unity with God. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That is the command. Let it. Do you hear? Let this mind be in you. Let it dwell in your heart. Let it see through your eyes. Let it hear through your ears. Let it breathe through your holy breath. Let it speak through your voice. Let it work through your hands. Let it control the function of your entire being. Before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Do you believe this promise, or are you determined to wait for your reward until some future time? Now is the accepted time, said Jesus. What cannot be had now cannot be had at all. Never say that God does not answer your prayer, for every one that asketh receiveth. Rather ask yourself, how do I pray? Do I pray in hope, or do I pray in faith? Do I ask for things that I believe I have, or do I pray for things I believe that I do not have? There is a vast difference, you know, for hope looks forward while faith accepts its good and present. This difference in attitude is just the difference between answered and unanswered prayer. Either you accept mentally and emotionally that for which you pray, even before it is obvious to the senses, or you cannot have it. Is that clear? If it is not clear, please do not leave this paragraph until you realize that your need is met before there is any overt evidence. The scriptures are very clear on this point, and yet it is one of the most difficult principles for students to recognize and apply. God calleth the things that are not, as though they were. The real test, you see, is to be able to declare it is done. When there is absolutely no evidence of the object or condition which we are seeking, this is the practical way of working, and there is no other way. The worlds were formed by the word of God, God's recognition and declaration that it was done. So that which is seen hath not been made out of things which do appear. This means that all visible things, money, houses, clothing, flesh and blood, were made of invisible substance by the spoken word of God. This is God's way of working. If we expect anything from him, we must work as he works. We must use the same law he uses. We must think as he thinks. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. When we have the mind of Christ, we have the fulfillment of every human need, the answer to every problem, and the supply to meet every demand. Do we wish more speed in our demonstration? Then we must remember that the speed with which any demonstration is made is determined by the degree to which we accept our oneness with God. Faith that is born of trust, which depends largely upon instinct and feeling for its existence, is both the substance and the evidence. It is the thing in its incipiency and in its actuality. It is the unseen and the seen, the invisible and the visible. To speed up the good in our lives, we must strengthen our faith. We must give the mind a more positive and constructive foundation upon which to work. We must feed our emotions with joy, with thanksgiving, with a sense of security. We must claim the things that are not as though they were. We must accept them in the present. All things are possible to him that believeth. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. That is just like saying that two plus two are four. We cannot put two and two together without getting four. Neither can we put our faith together with God's substance without getting results. Indeed, the law is just as certain, immutable, and accurate as a law that says that two plus two are four. God withholds nothing from us, but his giving is conditioned by our correct use of the law. 
When we are one with them and support our request with faith and feeling, we can draw the good things of life from the universe storehouse just as easily as we draw upon mathematical principles in working out our mathematical equations. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. We prove God by accepting our good in the present, by believing where we cannot see, by knowing while we do not know, by receiving what we do not have. All things whatsoever ye pray and ask for, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Believe that ye receive them. Present tense, can we do it? Can we believe without a sign? Can we accept something we do not have? Yes, we can, and we must if we would receive the answer to our prayer. When God gave his name to Moses, he said, I am, not I may be or I will be, but I am. I am, present tense. I am God and there is none else. I am now whatever I am conceived to be. I am whatever seems to be lacking, and I shall be whatever is added to my name or nature. I am the answer to all problems. I am the health of the body. I am the strength of the soul. I am supply. I am success. I am whatever is asked of me in the present moment. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. But he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder and the reward of them that diligently seek him. God is ever present as the answer to every problem and the fulfillment of every right desire. But the demand must be made from the heart before the answer or supply can come forth to fill it. Faith really has nothing to do with the evidence of the physical senses. When one looks at circumstance, he tends to let go of faith. Jesus said, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous or right judgment. We follow this command when we fix our attention upon God in the present and refuse to allow our vision to divide itself. When we understand that adverse appearances are the evidence of lack of faith in the good, we shall know that in order to change the appearance, we must unify our minds or cause them to move with God. We do that by recognizing that the good for which we are about to ask has already been provided. That which brings the answer is not the force of words or the struggle with the problem, but the realization that it is done. We solve a problem by turning it over to God and forgetting about it. When a problem first appears, it is like a hot potato. It cannot be held nor eaten. The only sensible thing to do with a hot potato is to drop it, let alone till it cools. Similarly, the only thing to do with a problem is to do nothing for the time being. Drop it, let alone, impersonalize it, let it cool. When we do this, we get a quick solution. When we persist in holding the problem in personal thought, we accentuate it. Attitude, which depends more upon feeling than it does upon knowledge, is the most important thing in your life. If your attitude which in the truest sense is the only problem there is, is not right, your control should be adjusted. The remedy needs to be applied at the source of the trouble, at the point of motivation, which of course is your thought life and your emotional state. What you think and feel about a problem is always more important than the problem itself. Your consciousness is your own. It is where you live and carry on all the activities of your life. It is where you get angry, hurt, doubtful, critical, sick, sorrowful, limited, worried, anxious, weak, and disagreeable. In fact, each circumstance, problem, and condition in your life, and each cell of your body takes its tone from the prevailing state of your consciousness and accordingly gives forth peace, power, plenty, and health, or discord, weakness, and sickness. Your consciousness is you. It is everything you are or hope to be. It is absolutely under your control and dominion at all times. You alone can determine what shall enter and dwell therein. You alone have the power to cast out what does not belong there. Choose this day whom you will serve. Choose right now whether your mind is going to be an open channel for God or an open channel for that which is unlike God. If you are really serious about changing yourself and your condition, say each time you are tempted to harbor some ugly, fearful, worried, critical, or condemnatory thought, My mind is an open channel for God. I accept the peace, love, and joy of God. Say these words and keep saying them and feeling them until you have transformed your mind with respect to the particular thing that is bothering you. To him that hath, 
to him who lives in the absolute consciousness of the presence of God shall be given. You can get the answer in no other way. Remember that it is your awareness and acceptance of God's presence that makes your words effective. Does this all seem hard for you? It is the hardest for those who are more interested in the problem than in the solution, who are more concerned with changing other people than with altering themselves. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. In applying the spiritual principle to any problem, there is just one thing to do, to open your mind to God. To get that door open and keep it open is the key to all successful Christian living, the answer to every prayer, the fulfillment to every desire. When one door closes, another door opens, is an old saying that can be applied without question to spiritual work. It is a law of mind that when the door of the conscious mind is closed, the door of the subconscious mind opens. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Open, not just a crack or an inch or a foot, but open wide. When the door is open, he will come in. When the door is open, he will answer your prayer. When the door is open, he will solve your problem. When the door is open, he will heal your body. When the door is open, he will supply your needs. When the door is open, ye shall see heaven open, and angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Yes, it is the closed door that has held you in bondage. It is the closed door that has kept you in the wilderness of indecision, failure, boredom, futility, depression, and sickness. It is the closed door that has kept the good things out of your life. If you have had some demonstration, it is because you opened the door part way, but you closed it again through your conscious thinking your habit of judging according to appearance and your belief in two powers. On this side of the door there is nothing but tribulation. On the other side of the door everything that is desirable awaits you. The things of the Spirit of God are spiritually discerned. You have the power, you have the dominion, you have the substance, the life, health, strength, and abundance. You have them in spirit, but you cannot demonstrate them, bring them into visibility until your door is open. The good things cannot be of any benefit to you until they circulate. In the Orthodox Church, this door is called repentance. In rational theology, it is called dying to self. Those who open the door are the poor in spirit, the humble, the meek, and those who become as a little child. The door begins to open and the blessings stream through when your thoughts are as little as 51% true, positive, and constructive. The door is wide open when you are surrendered to God with soul, mind, heart, and strength. Will you open this door, or are you going to sit outside begging for the bread that never comes, saying prayers that are never answered, claiming promises that are never fulfilled? Will you open the door, or are you more concerned with loaves and fishes, with unimportant things, with small necessities? Will you use the soft answer? Will you do unto others as you hope they will do unto you? Will you turn the other cheek? Will you give your cloak with your coat? Will you go the second mile? If you do not go far enough, remember the principle cannot work for you. If you have lost your sense of God and have been able to open the door of your subconscious mind, it will be profitable to you to discover the reason. Perhaps you are unwilling to pay the price in mental and spiritual coin. Perhaps you have not given up your negative thoughts. Perhaps you like to cling to your grudges and personal beliefs or like to dramatize and exaggerate your ills and troubles and misfortune. Perhaps you want your suffering to seem just a little worse than the other fellows. Perhaps you lack sympathy and try to make up for the lack of it by feeling sorry for yourself. Can it be that your troubles are more important than God? Can it be that you are giving more power to evil than you are to truth? Which is more important, to think about the living Christ within you or to think about your problems and ailments? Which is the way out, to magnify your troubles or to give them to the Christ who has promised to take care of them? The good you are seeking is already at hand. It is yours for the taking. You take it by embodying it, your thoughts, and by dropping from your mind everything that is unlike the object of your desire. You must make room for the things you really care about. Then the answer will come. Chapter 2 no room in the inn. There was no room for them in the inn, so Joseph and Mary learned when they came to Bethlehem. 
The town had cared for the taxpayers, but there was no place for the Christ child. There was a stable, to be sure, and an empty stall, and so the most sacred drama of all history was enacted in the manger of a stable. Carolyn Cole said, The inn became a symbol of lack and loss, and the stable a center of light, of deathless story and song. But why go back 2,000 years? The same drama is being enacted today. Even while you rush about, concerned with your problems, small duties, and temporal concerns, the Christ child is waiting to be born in your life, asking only to be allowed to create for you a new and spiritual consciousness which will forever give you peace. But there is no room. You are so busy with lesser guests that there is no room for the greater. There is no place for awareness. The glorious and beautiful celebration of the birth of Christ is now taking place in your mind. If you let yourself become aware of its significance and accept the gift as yours, your life will be transformed. Fear and want will go out of your life. Confidence and security will come in. All problems will yield to your understanding of Christ. But until you are emptied of yourself, there is no room for the Christ to be born. Where are you in consciousness? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to get? Where are you at the moment? In the frozen fastness of some incurable disease? In the hopeless state of failure? In the half-dead state of physical exhaustion? And what does your human mind say when the enunciation is made? When you are told, for instance, that you can be made whole? Is not this truth the Messiah, Redeemer, and Savior to your life and work? Will it not save you from whatever you need to be saved from? Haven't you heard that with God nothing shall be impossible? So where is your faith? Where is your feeling? Are you content to be one of those who, having only a partial knowledge of God, share His blessings only to a limited degree? You consider yourself a Christian. You pray and you do all the things that outwardly mark you a Christian. But you get into trouble and you have to muddle through. You get into financial difficulty and you have to borrow money. You get sick and you have to turn to the medicine bottle. Where now is your freedom, dominion, and power? Don't you see that it is your religion is good? It must be good for something. It must be immediately usable. It must be so flexible that you can adapt it in all your needs. Why do you celebrate the nativity? Is it to experience a new birth or is it to exchange material gifts? The answer will be found in the aftermath of your celebration. Do you emerge from this glorious event renewed, refreshed, and regenerated, or do you come out of it with jaded, worn, and frazzled nerves? Here is the greatest event in history, so great that time is reckoned from it, B.C., before Christ, or A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. The great oratories are built around it. Great classics of literature and art celebrate it. The national anthem bears witness to it. And why is the event so significant? Because of the renewing, vitalizing, and transforming power of the Christ idea. Do you see why eggnog and Tom and Jerry have no place in the marvelous event? We celebrate the new birth as though it were time for debauchery and profligacy instead of a period of soul unfoldment and regeneration. Is it any wonder that we do not raise the body to a higher energy level during the season? We approach the celebration with dread, and it takes weeks for us to recover from it. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Is that the whole story? No, thank God. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. There are two ways of celebrating the birth of Christ, one leading to peace and fulfillment, and the other to delusion and paralysis. It is important, therefore, that we approach this event in the proper attitude. If this corruptible is going to put on incorruption, we must commemorate this event in the right spirit. We are not decrying material gifts, but we are saying that they must be given in the spirit of tribute to the Christ child. Are you about your father's business? Then put all the herod or destructive thoughts out of your mind. We have been identified with John Doe or personality long enough. We have considered ourselves human, mortal, carnal, earthly, and we have reaped the whirlwind. What did Walt Whitman mean when he said, I celebrate myself? What did Jesus mean when he said, I came not to destroy, but to fulfill? They were proclaiming the Christ self of every man. If we celebrate only the birth in the manger, we do not celebrate ourselves. We miss the real meaning of the birth. Does that startle you? Let us settle this matter once and for all time. The real meaning of Christmas is that the Eternal is forever begetting the only begotten in us. Now check yourself by that standard. 
What is your appearance? I am not referring to your clothing. I am talking about the effect of your attitude, your character, and your disposition upon your expression and bearing. Does each celebration of our Lord's birth renew your conscious or spiritual strength and enable you better to go about your Father's business? What is your idea of yourself? Do you joyously discern the Lord's body, or do you painfully discern the body of John Doe? Reflect on that thought for a moment while we analyze our use of the word appearance. The body you bring forth will be exactly like the idea you hold of it, the feeling and thought you have concerning it. The birth of Christ in Bethlehem was only the beginning. The pattern, the recognition of the Christ, must continue in you. Yet in my flesh shall I see God. The new birth is not to be attained by the addition of something from the outside, but by the release of the splendor that is already within. Mary kept all these sayings and pondered them in her heart. Are you ready to magnify the Lord's body? Then set no time limit upon it. In a moment ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. It may take weeks, months, or even years before the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, but that moment is worth working and waiting for. The Christ idea in most people is like the sleeping Jesus in the ship during the tempest in the Sea of Galilee. It is unproductive and unavailing because it is unrecognized, imprisoned, and inactive. Why don't you start now to release this idea and give it dominion and power in your life? Why don't you give him a chance to transform and redeem your world? Did it ever occur to you that the illness that causes you so much pain and suffering may be your bitterness over a remembered wrong or your antagonism towards someone whom you have never forgiven? Did it ever occur to you that the hard condition in your body may be the result of some hard, ugly, limiting, and critical thought? Can the Christ be born in such an atmosphere? Can the answer come when there is no receptivity to it? Why don't you release all the germ-infested and poison-laden thoughts and forgive them in your mind? Which of you convinced me of sin? Why don't you look for the best in everything and in everybody? Why don't you look for the Christ in every man and leave judgment to God? When the Christ is released in you, you become a powerful factor in your thoughts, words, action, and feeling. Moving into the center of your life, he vitalizes and transforms all your relationships. The real purpose of the Christmas celebration was stated by St. Paul in the Epistle to the Galatians. I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. There are many ways of forming the Christ idea but the greatest factor is light. It is important that we go to church and that we fulfill our obligations. It is important that we have devotion, consecration, and reverence. But what good is all our church activity if the light is not allowed to shine? Churchianity and Christianity may be two different things. We may hold offices in the church and work in many guilds, but if the light does not shine, the result is superficial. I have a favorite couplet for which I regret that I can find no source. Verse, Though Christ a thousand times in Bethlehem be born, if he be not born in you, then all is forlorn. Christ is waiting to transform your world into a thing of radiance, joy, beauty, and freedom. Let there be light. This is as truly a command today as it was in the day when the earth was without form and void. The millennium will not come through cataclysmic events in the outer world. It will come from within man as he learns to have peace and love in his heart. Only as his heart becomes a manger for the birth of Christ can he share the song, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. This is your work in the Incarnation, and you must do it by giving full expression to the Christ Spirit within you. And when they had seen it, the thing which was foretold, the babe in the manger, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. When the truth is known, it must be put to work. It must be integrated with both conscious and subconscious perception. Please do not hurry over this part of the story, for it is here that most people fail. If you miss this part, you have missed the whole thing. Those who go all the way to Bethlehem manger, entering into communion with the Christ, return by another way. Their lives are changed. Those who only go part way return as they went unchanged. The Christmas tree, the candles, the ornaments, the gifts, and Santa Claus are all fine. But if the celebration stops here, the Christ remains inactive, passive, and imprisoned. As the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one unto another, 
Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Let us, too, see this wonderful thing in its entirety, and then put the resulting knowledge and vision to work. Let us do something about this new experience. Let us make it a part of ourselves. Let us synchronize it with the whole mind, conscious, subconscious, and superconscious. Then we shall see that this Christ, whose birth we celebrate, is a living, active presence within us, and shall know that of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. The birth of Jesus in Bethlehem was the turning point of the world. Someone has referred to him as that ideal character which through all the changes of eighteen centuries has filled the hearts of men with impassioned love. Even Ernest Renan, the skeptic, said, Whatever may be the unexpected phenomena of the future, Jesus will not be surpassed. His worship will constantly renew its youth, the tale of his life will cause ceaseless tears, his suffering will soften the best hearts, all the ages will proclaim that, among the sons of men, there is none born who is greater than Jesus. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let, let go and let God. There is something truly magical in these words, for the child that is to be born is the full and complete answer to every human problem. Christ is the answer to sickness, the answer to poverty, the answer to confusion, the answer to weakness, the answer to sadness. He turns sorrow into gladness, depression into ecstasy, confusion into peace, and lamentation into songs of thanksgiving. He is the youth that abides forever. The answer will come. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Christ that is born in us will be born for us when we stop looking for him outside of ourselves. If we think of him as a power over us, there is always an effort, a striving on our part to attain his height. When we think of him as a power within us, we free that which is already there. The Christ is personal to us because he is incarnated in us and responds immediately to our acknowledgement of his presence. The mythical birth of the Son is the recognition of our part of that indwelling presence. The highest form of communion with God becomes the conscious recognition of the Christ presence and our awareness of the response to our realization. Recognition, identification, this is the pattern by which Christ responds to us. God has made man in his image. He has given him the ability to recognize himself as it is in him. There can be no further progress until man cooperates with God, until he has the consciousness of himself as having been begotten, not made, that is, as begotten of God instead of human parents. Let Christ be formed in you. The whole universe is waiting for the man who will accept that challenge. The birth of Christ is a sign unto us. We talk glibly about the Incarnation, but few have done very much about it. No one has gone all the way to the manger. As yet, no one knows what the possibilities are of a conscious cooperation with God on the part of the individual, a cooperation carried to the highest degree, not only of belief, which is just a thing of the intellect, but also of embodiment, which is a thing of feeling. For unto us the child is born. When the divine moment comes, said Emerson, leaving all your theories as Joseph left his coat in the hands of the harlot and flee, throw all theories into the middle of the ocean, destroy the earth-made images and false beliefs, and settle down to a communion of feeling with God. The birth of Christ in the individual is an experience that cannot be imparted. Jesus wisely advised, Go and tell no man. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. If we ask the Christ to do anything for us, we must expect him to do what we have asked and not something else. On the other hand, God cannot give us anything unless we will take it. Unto us a son is given. But the acceptance of the gift is a voluntary thing. The gift of God's Son is individualized at the level of our embodiment of the gift. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss. We pray in the wrong way. We allow our feelings to counteract our prayers. Feeling is creative. 
We must stop responding to negative feelings if we wish to avoid negative results. We become creative in the positive by so completely embodying Christ that all other things have no reality in our mind. In our prayer, there must be the recognition that this absolute and complete presence pours itself through our word into action. There should be a balance between the conscious operation that we state in definite words and the idea that is embodied in those words, that is, the living consciousness of the perfection we seek. If we wish to demonstrate the presence of peace, we may speak the word peace a thousand times and get nowhere. But if we really feel the true import of the word peace, we shall have to say it only once. The individual who expects an answer to his prayer must work to realize the omnipresence of God, for the all-presence of God is manifested to the extent that it is recognized. The impersonal presence becomes personal to the extent that the individual senses the universality and omnipresence of God. Only as much of the infinite can find outlet as first finds inlet. Let us now go even unto Bethlehem. We come to the mystical conception of Christ, which is a specific concept of the universality of sonship embodied in any individual who recognizes this sonship and gives himself to it. The Christ has to be discerned by the individual mind itself. God is forever begetting that which is the realization of its own perfection. It is the eternal process. Christ is the Son of God, and the Son of God is Christ. The meaning of Christ, then, is the consciousness of God, of which we are a part. The birth of the Christ is the consciousness of the individual is mystical but not mysterious. It is a recognition that makes possible a greater degree of this divine incarnation, and that always will deliver a power to the individual commensurate with his conception. God can do for us only what he can do through us. The capacity of the instrument through which the power acts controls the amount of power that is delivered. Chapter 3 Unto us a child is born. They shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. All things are possible to God, provided they remain true to the nature of God. That which is untrue to the nature of God has no existence. When the child is born, we get the divine perspective. This new vision does something in healing that a merely psychological process can never do. The conscious recognition of the presence gives value to it. It gives reality to it. It gives conviction to it. It gives power to it. There is a power in us right now that awaits recognition in order to heal our every disease and solve our every problem. The old belief that the center of power was external to man is now giving way to the recognition of the presence within us, the realization that he is omnipresent. Carry this message to the uttermost parts of your world. Proclaim the glad tiding that unto us a child is born. Salute him with the richest gifts you have to offer, hearts and minds filled with the recognition of his presence and souls running over with joy. Just one moment's recognition and the child is born. Ask and it shall be given you, for every one that asks receive. Does the Christ give power to personalities and conditions, or does he give us power to command them? Does he give people power to harm us, or does he give us power to know the truth? It must be clear to us that the power were in the problem, it would not be solved. We must know that if the power were in the disease, it could not be healed. Stir up the gift, recognize the all-encompassing, all-pervading Christ Spirit. If the Christ in us has all power, the answer will come with this simple realization. Before they call, I will answer. The step between the problem and the answer is the act of recognition. The only difficulty in solving any problem is locating the center of power. When we know that there is no power superior to that which is within us, the answer will come. In the realization of divine power, the powerlessness of every problem is revealed. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee. That is the promise. Then why do we not always receive that which we ask for? Is there a law that worked for Jesus but will not work for us? If the lights in our house go out, do we conclude that the electricity has lost its power? Certainly not. We know without even thinking about it that the trouble is in the instrument and not in the power itself. We never doubt for a moment that the electricity will respond when an adequate instrument has been supplied. 
we know that there is only one presence and power in the universe, and that God is that presence and power. Yet when we are unsuccessful in our prayers, seldom do we look to the instrument, that is, our realization, for the cause of our failure. If the answer does not come, we must face the fact that we are misusing or misdirecting the power. God does not bring to birth and then not bring forth. This is one of the most wonderful principles of truth presented in the Old Testament. Of what good is an idea that is brought to birth and is never born? Of what benefit is a prayer that is never answered? So many times we have prayed and nothing has happened. So many times we have tried to think our good in a manifestation and nothing has appeared. So many times we have tried to make God work for us, but nothing has changed. All our human efforts have proven to be clouds and winds without rain. But in Isaiah we find this challenge. Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? There is nothing so difficult or such long-standing that the Christ cannot heal it. I am talking about the ailment that man says is incurable. I am talking about the problem that seems hopeless. There is nothing in the outer world, positively nothing, that can withstand the absolute consciousness of his presence. There are no physical problems that the Christ is in us cannot solve. Our power to solve them lies in our ability to realize the presence of power within ourselves. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Let the child be born, let the power come into action, let the answer come. Consider the lilies of the field, behold the fowls of the air. These words are foolishness to the man who is trying to make God do his bidding. He prefers to sit among the husks of personality and beg for his goods. The proud intellect has no time to look at lilies nor to consider the ravens. It believes that just by looking at flowers and birds and thinking of nature and beauty is a waste of time when there are bills to meet, bodies to heal, and harmony be restored. When shall we stop working with effect? When shall we stop trying to heal ourselves? When shall we accept the simple solution of the Christ and let the power operate through us? Call upon me. Can the intellect pull the lily out of the bulb? Can the human will pull the robin out of the egg, who by taking thought can force God into manifestation? Turn ye from your evil ways or false beliefs and live. Turn from intellect, fear, and worry to Christ. Until the corn or wheat is planted, we are limited to our present supply. Until the Christ is born, we are limited to personality. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee. The answer we have been seeking for these many years will come when we stop seeking it and recognize that it is done. We say with Job, Oh, that I knew where I might have found him, and all the time that Christ is within, awaiting a recognition. I and the Father are one. God is forever begetting that which is the realization of its own perfection. If we have two-ness, it must be redeemed. Have we rolled up the grave clothes of our belief in two powers? Jesus didn't say, I am getting life. He said, I am life. The child is born. You are the power, and the power is you. When we understand this truth, it will take us out of every kind of misery and distress. The former things have passed away. Behold, I make all things new. I make all things new by the renewing of the mind, by the embodiment of the Christ. The formless life of spirit is all there is, and so long as we have a material body, it must be redeemed. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. That is why we are told to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. When the individual recognizes his true relationship to God, the so-called power of the world cannot affect him. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Are we ready to recognize him when he comes? Are we enough like the power within us to have it manifest for us? In order to control circumstance, we must have all the power in heaven and on earth. We must be conscious of the whole, the Christ has all power, to become more like him is to possess the key of all demonstration. To be more like God is to have more of the things that we desire. The answer will come when we are in absolute harmony with the presence of God. When we become like him, demonstrations will take care of themselves. 
as we grow in the consciousness of his presence, we shall most surely have what we want, for we shall then manifest what we are rather than what we desire. The most important thing in the world to any man is his concept of God. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. You are coming to the place of recognition where the Christ is to be born. Is there room for him in the inn? Are you fully aware of the magnitude of the coming of the King of Glory? He comes into your consciousness, proclaiming a new heaven and a new earth, new circumstance and new conditions. This newness begins with your recognition of the newly born Christ. You are made a new creature, a new creation. All the false beliefs you have about yourself are stripped from you as you are lifted up into this presence. He takes away from you everything that is unlike himself. Instead of the limited intelligence of the human mind, you have the perfect intelligence of God. Let Christ be formed in you. As you contemplate his presence, the spiritual body is formed in substance. Right now your body and circumstance are being cleansed by the baptism of fire. The old cherished beliefs are melting away in the fervent heat. Loose thyself from the hands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Loose your feeble expectations. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. If thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Do you see the coming of the kingdom of Christ, the reign of righteousness and peace, the experience of unending joy, health, and supply? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Will you recognize the answer when it comes? Will you give hospitality to the highest? Isn't it wonderful that God had sufficient confidence in you to entrust himself to the cradle of your mind? Doesn't it give you a new sense of power and importance to know that the child to be born through your recognition is to become the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace? Doesn't the inexpressible magnitude of this gift take your breath away? With your acceptance, all thinking processes suddenly give way to the involuntary and automatic power within you. You are no more at the mercy of your false beliefs, for everything is governed and healed by the divine touch of the Christ. How precious is the thought of God with us! The Son of Man cometh at an hour when we think not. Now, my child, take your thought off the question, and give your attention to God. Unto us a child is born. Call upon him, and the answer will come quickly. When you are no more concerned about the question, the right decision will be pointed out to you. If the question in your mind is one of sickness, the answer will come as a deeper realization of health. If the question is one of limitation, the answer will be a deeper realization of supply. Everyone that asks receives. The child is born. The answer is always there awaiting your recognition. Will you accept it? Do you grasp the thought of what it means to be in Christed? Do you realize that he will live your whole life for you if you'll forget yourself? Why do you work so hard? Why do you struggle? Has an experience taught you that the intellect is a hard taskmaster? Or do you prefer the university of hard knocks to the wisdom of God? The keys of heaven given to Peter are recognition and self-forgetfulness. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Are you robbing yourself of the joys of the present because you are living in some unpleasant memories of the past? You must learn how to forget by remembering God. Leave off from your sins and forget your inequities. To meddle no more with them forever, so shall God lead you forth and deliver you from all trouble. Is it clear to you that the answer cannot come so long as you are remembering the problems? Jesus said, Go and sin no more. Have you put away childish things? Or do you still talk about your problems, your pains, and your disappointment? By reliving old pains, sorrows, and sins, you make them as vile as if they had come upon you at this moment. God does not forgive you, remember, until you forgive yourself and stop syndicating your sorrows. Glory to God in the highest. This is the birthday of your King. Arise, shine, for thy light is come when the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. What is in the program for this natal day? You are right now in a new world with new opportunities. Everything is brand new. Everything is dead but the present moment. There is nothing in this moment by God. There is nothing in it to link you with any of the unfortunate experiences, aches, pains, or disappointments of yesterday. Today is not just another day. It is God's day. It is so filled with His presence that there is no room in it for the dark sins of yesterday, nor for the bewildering uncertainties of tomorrow. There is not one nook or corner in which any of your old childish beliefs can hide. 
How do you feel in your new existence? Isn't it wonderful to have everything before you and nothing behind you? Isn't it thrilling to have the power within you to conquer every situation and to have the answer to every problem? Relax those furrowed brows. Let go of that worried look. In the consciousness of Christ's presence, you have a charmed life. You are vested with infinite wisdom and new strength. You are empowered with might to accomplish whatever you wish to do, to attract whatever you wish to have. New friends will find you and new opportunities will seek you. Today is the finest day you have ever known. It is the best day of your life. Praise it, bless it, grate it with a smile. Feel it so full of self-forgetfulness that every blessing will rest upon you and every experience will rebound to your highest good. Christ in me comes forth this day, and I behold myself as a child of God. Yes, I know you have had a hard time. You have led a very worldly life. You have done things you shouldn't have done and have said things you should not have said. You realize that you are unworthy and announce that fact loudly. But who are you that you should talk so shamefully about your beautiful self? Who are you that you should be living in the far country of your memory? Don't you know that a good forgettery is just as important as a good memory? Has the Father ever told you that you are a miserable sinner? Has He ever pointed the finger of scorn at you? Was the prodigal considered unworthy to enter the Father's house? Go and sin no more. Come and see what is taking place in the stable. The child is born, and you have a new beautiful life. God has given you forgetfulness. He has given you the ability to think of something more important than yourself, of something more important than your past. Would you enter again into peace and joy? Then give your mind to the mind of Christ. What you have been has no bearing upon what you can be. Remembering and forgetting are two ends of the same thing. Self-forgetfulness is achieved by occupying the mind so completely with the Christ that the personal self is entirely forgotten. They departed into their own country another way. When you leave the manger, you will never go back to the personality or the flesh pots of the human mind. From now on, the Christ will lead you in the path of peace and ways of pleasantness, in green pastures and beside still waters. He will walk in you, and you will learn that God is mightier than any circumstance. He will free you from the sin of holding yourself in the thought of limitation. He will teach you how to forgive yourself by disabusing your mind of the offending thought. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and he that heareth let him say, Come, and he that is a thirst let him come, he that will let him take the water of life freely. True spiritual progress depends upon self-forgetfulness. When Paul admonished the Hebrews to lay aside every weight and to run the race before them, he was not talking about armor, heavy shoes, and clothes, but about depressing emotions, heavy thoughts, and false beliefs. He was talking about the things that impede the flow of life, self-condemnation, criticism, jealousy, animosity, depression, sorrow, and fear. Lay aside every weight means to reject every belief that denies God. The answer will come through nearness to His presence. Lay aside the old state of consciousness for the new state of consciousness. Go forth this day to conquer and to subdue of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Do you begin to see the endless manifestation of good that is coming to you? Do you realize that the consciousness of the presence fills everything with the increase of his government and peace? Miracles are concomitants of this new understanding. At the wedding feast of Cana, Jesus turned water into wine, turning at the same time lack into supply, disappointment into joy. Have you turned your sickness into health? Have you turned unhappy situations into blessing? He has given you power to transform every curse into a blessing. When you no longer believe that an unpleasant situation has power to hurt you, you have robbed it of all its power. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The government shall be upon his shoulder. For unto us a child is born. The divine event has already taken place. Now you know the meaning of the words, I and my Father are one. The most effective prayer is the clear realization of the presence of God. The clear realizations of the answer is the fulfillment of the prayer. Never doubt that the answer will come. As the Christ is formed through your recognition of His presence, the material world will come and lay its gifts at your feet. And when they opened their treasures, they presented Him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I and my Father are one. The answer will come through your realization of the presence of that which is sought. 
in Christ shall all be made alive when we pray, believe, that is, realize that the answer already exists. The prayer for health will be answered when you have a clear realization of health. The prayer for success will be answered when you have a clear realization of success. The clear realization of the answer is the answer. To believe is to behold the object as a reality. Your every prayer, therefore, is answered according to your faith, according to your feeling, according to the degree of your realization that you already have in spirit what you are seeking in the world. According to your realization, it shall be done unto you. The answer will come. Chapter 4 The Star Went Before Them When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Even now the star is moving across your heavens, filling everything with light and peace. Silently the wise men, bringing priceless gifts, are following into the inner sanctuary of your soul. He who was so hard to contact through the human mind now comes to you through the process of recognition. Do you sense the surging power of this great love? Do you all feel all the old woes slipping away from you and all your sins being forgiven? At the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Let all that is unchristlike in you bow down before him and acknowledge the presence of the newborn Christ. Rejoice in the fullness of his power. For you his glory shines. To you his life is given. Of his fullness we all received in grace for grace. This is the way. Walk ye in it. In the absolute there is nothing in the universe that can improve or become better. The sick man does not suddenly get well. The deaf man does not suddenly hear. The blind man does not suddenly see. The poor man does not suddenly get rich. Everything is perfect, whole, and complete at all times. Man is not the reflection of God. He is the individualization or personification of God. Isn't that a marvelous concept? The more fully conscious we become of our identity, the greater becomes our sense of dominion and power. The individual who recognizes only one presence has the power to do anything he wishes to do. The only sin is the acceptance of a belief that denies God or limits his power. After you have listened to the expression of interminable personal opinions and experimented with several systems of human thought, you will eventually realize that there is nothing but God. You will recognize the truth in the words, I can of my own self do nothing. You will see the futility of knowing anything but the simple love and power of God. You will realize that nothing unlike him can share his presence. You will find that you cannot believe in half power or half presence and get anywhere. In absolute practice, you cannot compromise with evil in any way, shape, or form. I am the Lord thy God, and there is none else. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. If you suddenly accepted this commandment and were obedient to it, what would happen to the devil or divided mind? He would be as futile in your thinking as he is in reality. There would no longer be any problem of evil. If everyone knew God and knew nothing else, there could be no evil or disease in the world. Human misery is the result of trying to know good and evil at the same time. Unless you are willing to take a positive stand and give no quarter to the appearance of anything unlike God, you might as well stop right where you are. Until you can meet a belief in evil with an even greater consciousness of truth, the answer cannot come. We have seen his star and are come to worship him. View your problem from the perspective of the manger and it will lose its importance. Just as the mountain hills flatten out when seen from an airplane, problems are solved automatically and evil disappears in the transcendent vision of Christ. Open now mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. The moment you become one with this glorious presence, the veil of the temple is rent in twain and heaven stands open before you. You shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. For according to the scriptures, unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Do you begin to understand that the appearing of the Christ child is veiled to the conscious thinking of the human mind, and that before you can enter the stable you must have lost the conscience of yourself? That which is born, not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, is the Christ within you. He is the hope of glory, and his work in you is to sublimate every false belief and to abolish every limitation. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, till there is no longer anything in us that denies our good, till with whole mind and heart we acknowledge him to be Lord of all. Ye shall know the truth, 
the glorious heralds of the new day proclaim it, the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The truth is always the same, but our understanding has been imperfect and limited. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Are you inspired to hear? Have you seen his star? Have you recognized your divine sonship? The truth cannot benefit unless you recognize and embody it. It is given unto you to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, those in the carnal mind, all these things are done in parables. But this recognition, you will receive the truth, you will feel the truth, you will lose a little personal self in the universal. The day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of power. The answer will come. Chapter 5 On Earth Peace Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Would you have the angel of peace bless your world? Then you must have the mental equivalent of peace. You must give up whatever is antagonistic to your peace. You must establish peace in your own heart and soul. Peace, like war, begins in the human heart. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. Peace is an effect rather than a cause. It comes through cooperation. The Bible tells us that it are mental and physical conditions that demand spiritual surgery. If thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. That is pretty strong language, but the meaning is simple. Get rid of the things that are disturbing your peace. Is it hard for you to be peaceful? Then dislodge from your subconscious mind all discordant, inharmonious, bitter, selfish, greedy, envious, antagonistic, jealous, and intolerant thoughts. Listen again to the message of peace that came to earth on the night Jesus was born. Let it form in you a consciousness of itself. When peace reigns in your heart, there will be no friction in your body. When peace reigns in your heart, there will be no discord in your home. When peace reigns in your heart, there will be no conflict or war in your world. Peace does not begin at peace tables or in the council of nations. It begins in the hearts of men and spreads from mind to mind. We hear much in these days about disarmament, but disarmament is primarily a mental thing. It begins in the mind by circulating thoughts of peace, goodwill, love, and tolerance towards others. Have you disarmed mentally? Are you doing your part towards world peace? Then begin today. Think peace and live peace until it becomes your dominating mental state. The admonition that was given to the shepherds on the night Jesus was born is given to you. Fear not. When fear has been cast out of the mind, you can join in the angel chorus, Peace on earth, good will towards men. You can sing it with authority because you have peace in your heart. He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thy dash their foot against a stone. What did the prophet mean who said, There is no peace to the wicked? He meant that St. Paul meant when he said, The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Peace does not come through material blessings or possessions, but through righteousness. It is a state of being. There must be rightness with God, rightness with our fellow man, rightness in the home, rightness in business, and rightness in all our relationships. Peace comes through wholehearted cooperation with the Prince of Peace. My peace I give unto you. Jesus has come to bring peace to the world, but he can give the peace only when we make room for it in our own mind. Are you agitated, irritated, fearful, distraught, or annoyed? Then read the 37th Psalm, dwell on the words, fret not thyself. Center your thought in God and open your soul to his everlasting peace. Are you tearing your body to pieces and your mind to shreds? Stop when you are and get back into the rhythm of harmony. Reduce the tempo of your pace and slow down the action of your mind. Do you know what happens when you allow your mind to rush headlong from one activity to another? You become overstimulated and overexcited. You build up inflammation in the nerves, toxemia in the body, and friction in the mind. Do you know why you get into conflicts, controversies, and misunderstanding with others? Do you know why you collide with other personalities, why you get sick, and why you get out of adjustment with life? It is because you get ahead of God. You go so fast that he cannot keep up with you. The psalmist said, fret not thyself. The metaphysician said, if you do not reduce your pace, you will be eliminated. Who told you that you were so important? 
Where did you get the idea that you were Atlas and the problems of the world rusted upon your shoulders? If you must hurry, hurry slowly. Disease means lack of ease. Easy does it. It is a true saying, for ease is life-giving and peace-producing. Ease in a machine is the result of the harmonious adjustments of all its parts. Ease is a lubricant to the body and a stabilizer of the mind. Are you tempted to rush pell-mell into things? There is really no hurry about anything. You are living in what Judge Troward calls a universal here and an everlasting now. You have all eternity before you. A thousand years in his sight are but as a yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Yes, my friend, you need peace as much as you need anything else in the world. You need peace in your mind. You need peace in your nerves. You need peace in your neck. You need peace in your joints. You need peace in your muscles. Do you have a pain in some organ of your body? Then think peace into it. Are you troubled about what somebody has said about you? Think peaceful thoughts about him. Fret not thyself. Are you worried, apprehensive, or fearful about something? Are you discouraged, disappointed, or depressed? Then sit down and think peaceful thoughts. Center your mind in the healing presence of God, and let his peace flow unto you. Don't wait for a more convenient season to do this. Do it now. Do it when you are in the greatest turmoil. Do it in a time of crisis. Do it when you are so busy that you haven't even time to breathe. He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. You were made to live in peace. Your body was intended to function in peace. When you get into tension and turmoil, you step outside the will of God and disturb the rhythm of your life. You get off balance, so to speak, and you go to pieces emotionally and physically. Perhaps you are one of those persons who are working against the pressure of a deadline. Constant working against a time limit raises the blood pressure, generates restlessness, and cripples the digestion. The only time limit we have to consider refers to our need to ensure our spiritual development while we are on earth. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. In searching the scriptures for an affirmation or statement that can be used when the impulse to hurry appears, I found St. Paul's words, None of these things move me. When I am tempted to get disturbed, excited, upset, or hurried, I stop and repeat these words until peace returns to my soul. Then I turn to the 62nd Psalm, and I find another helpful statement. Wait only upon God. Why should I wait for God? Because He is the only stabilizing power in my life. The space between desire and fulfillment is very simple a matter of peaceful, patient waiting. If I want what God has to give me, then it is worth waiting for. Why then should I hurry? Hurry is the quickest way to failure. Hurry wastes energy, creates tension, generates friction, causes accidents, destroys peace, makes mistakes, and breeds fear. Fear that I won't pass the examination. Fear that I shall miss a train. Fear that I shall fail. Fear that I won't get what is coming to me. Fear that somebody else is trying to take advantage of me. Fear that I shall get into trouble. Hurry is devastating because it is a belief that personal effort is faster than the speed of thought. It will not let one wait for God. There is a vast difference, you see, between hurry and speed. Waiting on God is the quickest way to get things done. The speediest thing in the universe is the creative power of God. Do you believe it? Then slow down and give God a chance to show what He can do. Start each day with these words from an old hymn. Perfect freedom, I declare it, for the truth has made me free. Perfect peace, yea, not shall mar it, for my mind is stayed on thee. If it be possible, saints, says St. Paul, as much as lieth in you, be at peace with all men. The catch in St. Paul's direction is the word all. Be at peace with all men. Yes, the unlovely as well as the lovely, the disagreeable as well as the agreeable, the unjust as well as the just the stingy as well as the generous, the brilliant as well as the dull, the poor as well as the rich, the hateful as well as the loving. No, it isn't easy, but it can be done. Being at peace is a spiritual skill that is realized through practice and self-discipline. It marks a coming of age mentally and emotionally. The question is not whether we like a certain person or not, but whether we can practice the golden rule. In other words, can we grant to him the privileges which we want for ourselves? There is a solution to the problems of personal adjustment, and it is found in the ability to make peace. There is real wisdom in the saying, Heat not the furnace for your foe, so hot that it did singe thee. Abraham Lincoln once said, No man resolved to make the most of himself can spare the time for personal contention. 
Still less can he afford to take all the consequence, including the vitiating of his temper and the loss of self-control. We cannot help getting in one another's hair at times. We cannot help the wagging tongues of others, but we can react creatively to them. With all men includes you. If you find you are fighting against yourself, if you find you are at a cross-purpose with yourself, you can bring priests into your life only by placing every thought, word, action, impulse, and feeling under God's direction and control. The reason so many people collapse under duress is because they do not handle their strife creatively. The remedy is in the third beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. In other words, we must handle our problems. We must make our peace with it. We get the drop on it by taking our position on the hill. Do you understand what that means? It means we get above the conflict by changing our consciousness. We overcome it by coming over it. If ye be in Christ Jesus, you are above the law and not subject to it. We conquer by assent. The secret of victorious life lies in the constantly expanding consciousness of divine peace. In the preamble to the Constitution of UNESCO, we find these revealing words. Since wars began in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defense of peace must be constructed. If conflicts grow only in warlike minds, then peace grows only in Christ-like minds. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. All is calm amid the noises and din of the city streets. Raucous voices, screaming sirens, and grinding wheels gently comes the silent night of the beloved hymn. It is a silence of fulfillment and assurance. We are familiar with the silence that baffles us, but this is the silence of revelation. We know the silence of death, but this is the silence that resurrects, renews, and restores. We know the silence of uncertainty, but this is the silence of confidence and power. We know the silence of emptiness, but this is the silence of fullness and abundance. We know the silence of speechlessness, but this is the silence of an overflowing heart. It is a silence we do not wholly comprehend, the silence of oriental kings bending quietly over a humble manger or sun-bronze shepherd paying homage to a newborn child. Do you see the picture? Do you feel the throbbing silence of this event that is to change the world? All is calm. This morning there was confusion, conflict, and disagreement. Tonight there is harmony, peace, and understanding. Where did this calmness come from? It didn't come from anywhere. It was always here, here in the hearts and souls of men. Our recognition has opened the door closed tight by the conscious thinking. Did you accept the invitation, cast your burdens on me, and I will sustain you? Though the peace may be obscured, though the angelic songs may cease, though the manifestation of light may disappear, the Spirit of the Christ will still be here, ready to enter when the place has been prepared. What place? The place of your consciousness. I go to prepare a place for you. What kind of place? a place where God pours himself out in every imaginable form to meet your present and future needs. Every good and every perfect gift cometh down from above. In the twinkling of an eye, the moment you stop seeking it, the answer will come. It is here now awaiting your recognition. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. All is bright. Whence comes all this brightness at Christmas time? Whence comes this light that makes for happiness, joy, love, peace, and healing? It comes from the Christmas star, which has its own source in the eternal. That is why the light of Bethlehem will never go out. Shadows may deepen and darkness may cover the earth. The lights of brotherhood, goodwill, love, tolerance, and mercy may temporarily be dimmed, but the darkness only accentuates the brilliance of that light. The light itself will never varnish. Do you see why it is incumbent upon you to walk toward the light? It has to do with the shadows in your life. If you walk toward the light, the shadow will fall behind you. If you walk away from the light, the shadows will fall before you. Jesus did not pray for some new glory, but for the same glory he had before he came into the world. Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. It is the same glory we are seeking now. Glorify thou me with the glory I had with thee before John Doe was. Heal this separation in my mind and dissolve the darkness in my thought. Help me to see myself as I am in spirit. Clarify my vision so that I may see the perfection which is already there. Tell me where to find this light. Are you listening? Do you want to know where to find the light? It is within your own consciousness. It is the light that lighteth every man coming into the world. 
It is the light of the world. Here the human touches the divine. Here John Doe dissolves into Christ. Why are your eyes holden? Why is your vision distorted? Because you have been trying to see this light through the double power doctrine of the human mind. You have trying to put it through the glass of your conscious thinking. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? You have been hindering yourself by trying to accept the lie and the truth at the same time. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. When the shepherds heard the song of the angel chorus, they bowed down in adoration before the light that enfolded it. When you relinquish everything to Christ, you are no more under the law of your own thinking. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Denying the self means renouncing the mortal mind and its manifold appeals. Everything that possesses you must be given up. Everything you would possess must be relinquished. You must make no claim to anything as your own. Leave all and follow me. Let go of the part in order that you may gain spiritual possession of the whole. As you realize your unity with the Christ, the words spoken by the aged Simeon when he looked upon the Christ child will be fulfilled for you. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Chapter 6 Go even unto Bethlehem, and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Going to the manger is symbolical of recognition and acknowledgment. Before you can join Christ in his consciousness, you must forsake the conscience of yourself. You will find everything in the manger in Bethlehem. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. The doctrine of self-denial is a paradox. If you gain, you lose. If you lose, you gain. But it means simply that when you lose the lesser, you gain the greater. If you lose yourself, you gain God. You must do this, for the Son can do nothing of himself. For we know in part, we are prophecy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. No, no man after the flesh, no, no personality, no problem, no illness, no defeat, no, nothing after the appearance, but present every man or manifestation perfect in Christ Jesus. Let us now go on even unto Bethlehem. But why must you go to Bethlehem? that you may see this thing that has come to pass, that you may identify yourself with him, that the lesser degree of life may be swallowed up in the greater. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Come and see. Unless you come to the manger or point of recognition, you cannot feel the baptism of his love nor enter into the fullness of his joy. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Handle me and see, and I, if I be lifted up from my earth, will draw all men unto me. Lift yourself up to the point of recognition and identification, and you will partake of the Christ nature. The thing you have been seeking will be added to you automatically. The lesson of the manger is the lesson of identification. It is one that everyone must learn. We come to it through Christ, through humility and self-forgetfulness. I and my Father are one. In this knowledge is the secret of demonstration and the answer to the prayer. The great error in practice is the belief that you can work on two planes at the same time. Self-consciousness is vinegar and salt to the wound. You do not need to think about your ears, your eyes, your body, or your business. Jesus said, take no thought. Stop thinking about yourself. Stop thinking about your problems. It is not the objective side of your life that needs treatment, but the mind of the flesh the personal thought that still believes in the fleshy body in the material world. Whether you are treating yourself or someone else, you must always remember that you are the only patient. The personality is the only adverse condition there is. You must practice recognition until the Christ appears, until you awaken in his likeness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, the recognition of his presence, and his righteousness, right idea of the universe, and all these things, forms of consciousness, shall be added. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. 
Behold, I make all things new. You make all things new, not by working to heal yourself or others, not by the concentration of thought, but by the simple process of realizing the perfection that existed before you declared it. Treatment does not cause perfection to appear. It awakens us to the perfect man within us. Let us now go even unto Bethlehem. Let us go at once to God. Let us know that we are a part of his government. Let us feel the power of his presence at all times and under all circumstance. The technique of metaphysics may be summed up in four words. Trust everything to God. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct the path. By taking attention from appearances, you can unknow that which is untrue. You unknow that which is untrue by agreement with that which is true. To pray without ceasing means literally to practice God's presence without ceasing. Put up thy sword. You do not need to fight or struggle with personalities or conditions. You have only to awaken to the power that is within you. When you recognize him as the only presence and power, you automatically deny the appearance of evil. You rule it out, so to speak. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway of our God. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, return, recognize God. The right motivation for action is to do everything for him. If you are having personal trouble of any kind, try doing what they have to do for God and not for any person. This approach works wonders. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk or feel not after the flesh or personal things, but after the Spirit. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. You have heard it said that faith without works is dead. But what are the works of faith? If the principle of truth is involuntary and laborless, why should one work to bring about results? The works of faith are the actions of belief and feeling. Believe that ye receive. You must act the part. You must wed your conduct to your ideals. If you do not have a clear realization of the thing you are working for, the answer cannot come. Your clouds are barren without rain. Behold, I send my messenger from before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Faith in action sees and feels a beneficent rain when there are no clouds. The answer will come when you have completed the belief within your mind. One often hears the question, How do I know that what I am asking for is the right thing? Have you guessed the answer? Acknowledge me. If you are seeking his presence in the place where he seems to be absent, you are always right. There can never be any question about its being the right thing. Be ye always abounding in the work of the Lord. Metaphysics is not an end of spiritual endeavor, but a means to an end. It is a method of conditioning our lives to God. The mere knowledge of metaphysics does not in itself bring freedom to the individual, but the practice of that which is metaphysical does. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Cast your net on the right side. To acknowledge him in all your ways is to live the spiritual life. There are just two parts to the creative process. Stated very simply, they are recognition and non-resistance. You must be specific in your claims and then not worry about whether they come out your way or not. The answer will come when you stop thinking about the problem, when you stop worrying and outline, in the moment ye think not. This is the rule of demonstration. The first part, man's responsibility, is a more or less conscious operation. The second part is purely involuntary and automatic. The thing to remember is that it is God who does the work and not you. The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also the Son doeth likewise. Companions of the Incarnation, God's work is finished. It is complete in every detail. Our work is to behold it as it is. God is the law. He is the supply. Our work is to be obedient to the law and to receive the supply. Law is the way in which God works. The law is impersonal and impartial. It must be obedient to its own terms. Jesus was a master of spiritual law and consequently the master of its results. His great purpose was to demonstrate that by applying the law we prove it. Turn the other cheek. Give your cloak with your coat. Go the second mile. In other words, go the limit with the law. Partial obedience will bring only partial results. We keep no law until we go all the way. Resist not evil. Non-resistance is the affirmative factor in a speedy demonstration. It is the great word in spiritual practice. It is a science in itself. 
just as tension restricts one's goods, non-resistance releases it. Anxiety, worry, fretting, doubt, and fear are all forms of resistance that create friction in the mind and heat in the body. Resistance is a recognition of power and evil. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The house divided against itself is the mind that believes in two powers. A boomerang will return to the thrower without any effort on his part. When a sponge is squeezed tightly in the hand, it loses its contour as a sponge. Nothing will restore its natural shape except release. Then quite automatically the sponge assumes its normal condition. The same thing is true of our problems and of the false beliefs about the body. The problem that is constantly held and the restrictions of personal thought cannot be solved. The diseased organ that is constantly in thought cannot be healed. True prayer is the recognition of a perfect universe that can have no quality that is unlike God. The metaphysical student must be exclusive. He must exclude everything but the presence of God. He must keep himself so completely out of his personal consciousness that the answer can come to him. As he holds fast to that which is good, the Christ is born. No amount of study on a problem is going to solve it, and no amount of denial and worry is going to cure a man who is sick. And the recognition of the presence, the answer, and the healing will be instantaneous. Ignorance gives way to knowledge, and God is revealed. In the new heaven and new earth are to come out of us. They must come through our recognition of the finished kingdom of God. We must be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We must know that he is within us, greater than he that is in the world. Spiritual superiority is won by way of non-resistance. Resist not evil, the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. He careth for you. There is a vast difference between the caring of the human mind and the loving care of the Father for his children. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. The invitation is given to us when we accept it. We are immediately under new management and direction. Can we hold up the universe? Then we must give it over to God. Come unto me. The non-resistant attitude is magical in its effect. It is the most relaxing, health-building, restorative attitude that anyone can assume. Which is more important, God or our business? Are our affairs going to the dogs? Is our world upside down? What is that to thee? Follow you me. When everything is at sixes and sevens, we need a new manager. We need God and his loving care. Non-resistance is constructive, while resistance is destructive. Let the worried man practice the I don't care attitude. Let the sick man practice it. Let the dying man practice it. When you cease to care about a thing in the sense that you are not anxious, it will cease to trouble you. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. If we are conscious that we are at one with God's peace, harmony, and love, we shall know that nothing in the world has power to harm us. We shall release the word without any thought about results. If we have the I don't care attitude, we leave any fighting to God. He alone has power, and we open ourselves to it through recognition and non-resistance. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. The answer will come when we cease to be resistant. Chapter 7. Magnify the Lord. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Joy to the body, joy to the mind. Isn't it wonderful to know that when we stop looking to personality or self-consciousness and recognize the Christ, we are instantly healed? He that loses his life, the human conception of himself, shall find it in the mind of Christ. Praying the prayer of recognition, we rest non-resistantly. Having done all, we stand and see the salvation of the Lord. We sing the magnificent with Mary. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Isn't it marvelous how God comes into expression when we do nothing ourselves? He commands us, Salute no man by the way. Again he said, I am the way. My way is the way of recognition, agreement, and non-resistance. Glory, hallelujah, Christ is born. Not in far off Bethlehem, but in the glorious now, right in the midst of all our fears, worry, struggles, and sorrow. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. The Spirit of Christ is in the air. His birth brings joy to our hearts. It brings joy to the whole world. 
long-deferred hopes are quickened in immediate fulfillment. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy may be full. One of the most significant things about the Incarnation is the stable with Christ's cradle in the manger, for it serves to remind us that the Christ, reborn in us, descends into our animal or fleshy nature and environment, in order that he may work through us to lift us up again to the perfection of wholeness of the Son of God. Yet in my flesh shall I see God. We have seen his star and are come to worship him. It is the happiest day of all the year. Above the pain and sickness, poverty and death, above the darkness of fear, failure or strife, above all the shadows of sorrow and disappointment, we feel the power of Christ, the power of his peace, the power of his faith, the power of his joy, the power of his righteousness, and the power of our own divinity. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Do you want a Christmas that will last throughout the year? Then do not pack the spirit of Christmas away with the lights, tinsels, and ornament. Keep it alive by embodying it in your thoughts. Think what it would mean if you carried the spirit of Christmas over into the rest of the year. If you greeted everybody between January and December with the enthusiasm that you put into your Christmas and New Year greeting. If you gave the same concern to the poor and needy. If you gave the same consideration to your employees or employer. If you were as thoughtful in correspondence with your friend. The test is not how you feel on Christmas Day, but how you act in June, how you meet conflict, disappointment, grievance, or frustration in February or October. There is nothing wrong with the Christmas festival but man's observance of it. If it ends with a bad cold, regrets, laments, and the comparison of gifts received with those cents, it becomes a hollow mockery. If you must check your bank balance and kick yourself for spending too much, if you must chide yourself for eating and drinking too much, if your observance lasts no longer than the wreath on your door, then you have truly missed the real meaning of the feast. It is true that wonderful things happen at Christmas time. Hard hearts are softened, the soldiers clasp hands with their enemies, criminals become benevolent. But what are the implications of Christmas for you? Don't you see that your whole destiny is tied up with the feast, your salvation, your immortality? What good are Christmas cards and sermons that are not translated into practical action? Mary kept all these sayings and pondered them in her heart. Are you going to let Jesus be born one day and die the next? Are you going to let the Gloria in excelsis die away before the dawn comes? Of course, there are distractions, problems, ills, disappointments, conflicts and misunderstandings that you will meet. But how are you going to meet them if you do not keep the Christ alive in your thought? Did it ever occur to you that today might be Christmas Day? It could be, you know. No one knows the exact date when Jesus was born, and it might just as well have been on the 4th of July or the 22nd of February, or perhaps on the very day that you injured a friend, took advantage of a customer, or spoke an unkind word. It could be any day, and that is one more reason to express the Christ spirit throughout the whole year. If he is going to come alive in the world today, he will have to come alive through us. We are told to let the child be born in us, so that the inner glory glow will be translated into practical action. For unto us a child is born. Did you ever a message embody greater joy? Did any other carry so great a sense as expectancy? The long-awaited Messiah is here. Before these words were spoken, the night was the darkest in history, but the darkness fled before the light of truth. The divine event is taking place in each one of us now. When we recognize the Christ in ourselves and in every other man, when we identify ourselves with him and feel his omnipresence to the extent that we become wholly non-resistant, we too experience the advent and can truly sing, My soul doth magnify the Lord, for the answer has come to us. Rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things, give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. Chapter 8 Before They Call if you have read this far thoughtfully, you know that the Christmas story, like everything else in life, has two sides, the outer and the inner, the objective and the subjective, the transitory and the permanent. We love the story of Mary and Joseph, their journey to the crowded inn, the birth of Jesus in the stable, and the flight into Egypt. We love the little town of Bethlehem, immortalized in story and song. We become children again as we sing the Christmas carols, visualize the star, the angels, the wise men, and the shepherds. 
no matter how we look at this marvelous and magnificent event, it does something to us. It has the power to soften our hearts and to bring joy to our souls and peace to our mind. Why? What gives it this power? It is the Spirit of God moving in us, awakening us to the fact that this divine event of 2,000 years ago can also be the inner experience of each of us today if we only release the Christ within us. You who have read these lines have played each one of the parts in the Christmas drama as you have moved from things to ideas, from sense to soul. You are Joseph who guards and protects Mary. You are Mary magnifying the Lord within you. You are the shepherds kneeling in quiet adoration before the cradle. You are the wise men seeking the light that never goes out. Bethlehem is the human mind. Here your cramped and crowded thoughts push the Christ child into the background of the stable, and only the outer or objective side of Christmas is celebrated. It becomes the festival that must be interpreted in terms of pocketbooks, checkbooks, department stores, toy shops, tinsel ornaments, lights, music gifts, and innumerable Santa Claus figures. The other side of the nativity is subjective and unseen. It is the birth of Christ in the human heart. It is the creative process of mind releasing in us the Christ concept of ourselves as sons of God, heirs and joint heirs to all the Father is and has. We all love to give and to receive Christmas presents and particularly enjoy the beautiful wrapping which seems to be so much a part of the gift. The wrappings, however, are soon discarded and forgotten. While the gift remains to give us pleasure and to remind us of the giver, C. Willard Fuller, in the sermon, We Behold His Glory, says, Ideas are like gifts, and the words we use in expression our ideas are like the wrapping. Words are important, but they are only the colorful paper in which we wrap our ideas as we exchange them. The truth contained in the idea is what we cherish. The early Christians had a great idea about Jesus, a truth which they had discovered and experienced, which they cherished. In expressing this idea and giving it to their neighbors, they wrapped it up in beautiful packages. Ever since there have been some people who have mistaken the wrapping for the gift, who have cherished the wrappings and lost sight of the beauty of the idea they contained. Unless you look at the Christmas story in terms of God's intention, unless you recognize its purpose and accept its mission, you too may mistake the wrapping for the gift. When the season passes, what happens to your joy and radiance? Do you carry them with you through the year? Better still, do you carry you through the year, or did you miss the idea under the wrapping? Can it be that you left the babe in the stable? You must be realistic about this festival. What do you see and hear? What do you feel about the Incarnation? What does it mean to you? The material gifts that abound on the day are merely symbols of the spiritual gifts given to us, imperishable gifts that we cannot wear out or destroy. Gifts that grow brighter with us, stronger with exercise, and dear with familiarity. Gifts that we should be expressing every moment of every year. Such gifts as these are life, because it is. Love, because life moves to a fuller development of greater life. Light, because it perceives an infinite expression yet to be. Power, because there is no opposing force and because it cannot stop short of action. Peace, because no part can be antagonistic to any other part. Beauty, because all parts are duly proportioned. Joy, because it finds pleasure in the self-expression with its work affords. We use the words sick, poor, unhappy. They are wrappings. We say failure. That too is a wrapping. We greet one another with the wish, Merry Christmas. Back of these declarations, back of these words is something that is real and eternal. If you are tied to words, to symbols, to wrappings, it is because you are accepting them as real. Jesus said, Judge not according to appearance or symbols, but judge righteous judgment. No other words get into the holy paper and tinsel and get to the contents as these do. If for you Jesus never gets out of the stable, if the Christ is never born in you, your life will be empty and forlorn. What is this mighty event that sets the world to singing, giving up and giving and loving? Is it just a pious myth trumped up by ecclesiastical minds, or is it the meaning of the story practical and pragmatic? What think ye of Christ? What do you find beyond the objective Christmas? What do you find under the wrapping? Zechariah said, He hath wrought redemption for his people. How? What is the answer? Where is it? In the Christmas story. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save the people from their sins. What sins? everything that is less than perfect. Jesus always meet man at the sharpest point of his needs. Where should you look on Christmas morning to the tree and the gifts under it? 
No, not there. Turn first to the Christ child within yourself. Let the newborn concept come out in your life. Lift it above everything else. You are dealing with a baby that must be allowed to grow, a baby that will overcome the world. Can you hear the undertones of the unbelievers at the first Christmas scene? What fools these men are, coming with their gifts to a baby. How can a baby help a man in trouble? How can a baby heal a leper, open blind eyes and unstop deaf ears? How can a baby multiply substance? Do you see why the Magi were the wise ones? They worshipped at a cradle, a small thing, you say. Yes, but in the cradle was all the power of the universe, the incarnation of God, the hope of mankind. That is why the Magi stand there with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. That is why we celebrate Christmas. There is a baby in that crib who will one day change the heart and life of the world, who will bring peace and brotherhood to the earth. You can talk about Christmas, preach about it, and sing about it until doomsday. You can celebrate the Christmas seven days a week. But if you do not feel the impact of the truth in Christmas story, you will emerge from the celebration unchanged. What is all this fuss about? It is about a newborn idea that must grow up in a man and become part and parcel of his consciousness. Answer me. What think ye of Christ? What think ye of this babe in Bethlehem's crib? Is he real or is he a figment of the imagination? What is this incarnation which the church has preached for the past two thousand years? Is it true or is it false? Is it valid or is it fiction? What is this feast in which God and man came together? Is there a power that can fill the vacant and low places in your lives? Is there a power that can make the rough places smooth and the crooked places straight? Is there a power that can lift us from these beds of pain and make us whole? The Christmas story says there is such a power. And Isaiah said, The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Why haven't we found this power sooner? Because we have never gotten under the wrapping. We have been observing an abbreviated Christmas. We have substituted an X for Christ. But Xmas is symbolic too. For peace it substitutes noise. For carols it substitutes carousals. For reality, it substitutes symbols. Christ is not an unknown quantity to be designated as X. Let us keep the Christ in Christmas. Let us celebrate the whole anniversary, not part of it. The X belongs in the Old Testament. The birth of a Savior was prophesied in the Old Testament, but it became a reality in the New. We have talked much in this book about need and fulfillment, prayer and answer, problem and solution. We have learned that the answer always precedes the prayer. It is the unknown quantity that man searches for in his personal problems. We all wish answers to our prayers and solutions to our problems. The sick want to be healed, the impoverished want supply, the souring want comfort. These are all legitimate desires whose fulfillment depends upon our understanding of the principle. Jesus told us to seek first the kingdom of heaven. When we put first things first, when we know and understand principle, the answer will come automatically, and all these things shall be added unto you. Our questions will be answered when our consciousness receives and embodies the divine presence. Answers will appear when the principle is properly applied. Do you see now why our Christmas must be both objective and subjective? If the Christ is to be born in us, and this is the real implication of the Incarnation, we must not only number the years backward to his birth, but we must bring them forward into our own experience. Before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will give it unto them. What does this promise mean? It means that every problem in your life carries with it the answer. The solution comes with the problem. It is revealed when the principle is properly applied. It also means that you are adequate to any need, circumstance, or condition that may arise in your life. My grace is sufficient for thee. It is done. Our health and supply exist in precisely the same place in which the need of healing and supply arises. The more we embody the divine presence, the quicker we shall see a manifest. Now hear the proclamation again. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Are you in need of healing? Then ask yourself these questions and ponder the answer. What is health? Health is a divine state of being. What is life? Life is a state of consciousness. What is the body? The body is an effect of consciousness. What governs and controls the body? Consciousness. What is consciousness? Consciousness is God. How do you prove your dominion over sickness and disease condition? 
by realizing that the government of the body is upon God's shoulders, and God has absolute control over that which appears a disease or a problem. You love Christmas with its festivity, music, and laughter, of course, but you must love something else more. You must love that which you are revealed to be in the narrative of the Nativity. This is your Bethlehem, your city of David, and your new birth. In the lowly stable of your heart, there is born the power of truth, the power that changes everything in your life that is unlike God, the power that makes you strong instead of weak, the power that makes you rich instead of poor. Are you looking for answers? Then stop where you are. The problem was solved before your prayer was said. When you know that discouragement, limitation, restriction, and sickness are the outcropping of your own consciousness, you will rise above them through the realization of your oneness with God. This healing is not the result of God's action at this point, for God is always the same. The healing comes when you lift yourself to a higher plane of existence. What shall we say to you if you complain because your prayers are unanswered? There is only one thing to say. Ye ask amiss. Your prayer is unanswered because you believe that God's universe is incomplete. You are asking Him to give you something, solve something, do something, heal something, and your prayer is consequently without power. Think of the joy of being able to say, The government shall be upon His shoulder. When you give the problem in its entirety over to Him, and let Him handle it, the problem in your home, in your job, in your social relationship, your prayer is answered. Before they call, I will answer, is the promise. The government shall be upon his shoulder, believest thou this? Then stop looking to persons, places, conditions, and things outside yourself. Stop looking to your minister or practitioner, ye ask amiss. Whenever you seek anything apart from or outside your own consciousness, if the kingdom of God, reality, or being is within you, everything you need is within you and must be claimed there. It is done. The all good is an instant manifestation. The good that you are seeking is seeking you. It exists in abundance and is forever manifested. Know this. Believe it. Accept it. The realization of this truth is the answer to your prayer. That which I decree, I am. That which I accept, I have. When I receive and embody the divine presence within my consciousness, that consciousness is the answer to my needs. All these things shall be added. Merry Christmas. How many times have you said that to your friends? What do you think? What do you feel? And what do you say in these glad words? You are saying that the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor of the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Yes, peace, the very peace the world is seeking right now. It begins with me and with you and you and you, and of the increase of his government there shall be no end. Beloved, the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. The song of the angels still lingers in our ears. The promise hath been fulfilled. The new day has dawned. The new sun has risen with healing in his wings. Unto us, unto me, in me, around me, under me, over me, and through me, a child is born. A son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. End of chapter. End of book. This audio presentation of The Answer Will Come by Robert A. Russell.